very much, Liv. Um, good afternoon again, everyone. Uh, I'm going to be, uh, uh, well, first of all, I'm going to try and not rush, but at the same time, I'm going to do my absolute best to stick to time, so bear with me. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, ways that we can better understand human burial taphonomy by using actualistic experiments with human remains, like the ones that Clara just presented on, um, in conjunction with uh, different 3D data collection techniques as well as uh, data analysis techniques. Uh, again, as a warning, this presentation does include images of human remains. I'm not going to be looking at all the stages of decomposition, but again, please don't take any photos of those particular slides. You're welcome to take any other uh, pictures. Um, first off, uh, although this talk is just about the burial taphonomy, I wanted to note that this is part of a broader project that I initiated in 2014, and it has different tiers of collaboration. And the two main other ones are working with the same uh, donated human remains that I'm working on. One of them is um, a study of the effects of diagenesis and decomposition on isotopic composition of different tissues of the body, um, which is mainly for forensic applications, uh, identification purposes. And the other is a proteomic study, again on the same human uh, remains, uh, with the aim to improve post-mortem uh, interval estimation as well as age estimation for individuals. So just here, uh, so you're aware that this is more than just the uh, taphonomy component. So um, basically the aims of this part of the project is to examine and to test certain taphonomic models that are used in archaeotanatology. So as you are probably aware, in this field, researchers are aiming to reconstruct mortuary practices, and they're doing it by very carefully examining the specific position and relation of bones within their burial environment. And there are, two, uh, there are two main models that are used in this field that I'm interested in assessing by studying actual decomposing bodies. Um, and that is firstly the idea that there is this order and disarticulation that uh, Clara already spoke of, that certain bones, and we see the same image from Christopher Knusel on the, on the side here, um, that the bones uh, disarticulate in a specific order, some of them earlier than others. Um, and this idea that once the bones are disarticulated at the joints and they are free to move around if there is enough open space to do so, that that will lead to specific patterning in how the bones end up and how we recover them as archaeologists. Um, so I set up an experiment where we can test uh, the different variables that influence these processes in uh, decomposing remains. And I focused specifically on certain uh, existing hypotheses in archaeotanatology. The first one um, is very closely related or overlapping really with Clara, which is great because we have comparative data um, on primary and secondary open space around the body. Primary being open space that was available once uh, someone was buried. So, for example, the interior of coffin. Secondary open space being space that is created or, or happens throughout the process of decomposition of the body. Um, then the effects of body position on the final pattern, the spatial pattern that we observe the bones in. Uh, and finally, the notion that um, depending on the condition that the body is in when it's buried, whether it's fresh or mummified, this, the spatial distribution of the bones will differ and it will lead to a pattern that we can distinguish archaeologically. And these are things that are always interested in testing in, um, in actual decomposing cases. Now, uh, an important underlying premise to this study is that um, all stages, but particularly the early stages of decomposition, are hugely important in understanding funerary treatment, engagement and handling of the body of the, uh, of the, uh, uh, the people that survived the deceased. But it's also just as important if we want to understand the relation and the position of the bones as we find them in an archaeological burial. So if we really want to better understand burial taphonomy, then we also need to understand these very early stages of decomposition. So um, the experiment with the donated uh, remains started in 2015 at the Forensic Anthropology Center in Texas when I started receiving uh, donated remains. And broadly speaking, there's two um, projects running at the same time. The first is a pilot study, which uh, included five human body donations, which I uh, placed in different positions uh, with primary and secondary open spaces and um, in one case, a mummification, and the rest as fresh burials. 
Um, and the pilot study is used to assess the sequence of disarticulation, as well as how the bones are moving throughout the decomposition. And then there's a longitudinal study alongside that, that thus far has uh, 25 human body donations. And these are all placed on the surface of the ground in the same uniform body position. And the idea for those is almost as a check for the others to track the disarticulation sequence in bodies in the same position. Um, so data collection of the study for the disarticulation sequence basically involved me observing the joints of the body uh, on a daily basis. And for the displacement of the bones over time, I created um, uh, 3D models using structure for motion photogrammetry at weekly intervals. And then at the end of each experiment, once the bones were cleaned and returned to the lab, I created a 3D model of each individual bone of the body. And we'll see why that's uh, important later on. Um, so just a very brief, and I'm, I'm sorry I don't have time to go into all of these, but please speak to me after. Um, this is an overview of the five pilot study individuals, and you'll see the variation in body position with donation one and donation three being in an upright seated position. Donation three is buried, donation one was in an open pit. Um, we have donation four and donation two who were buried uh, or either buried or in an open pit but flexed on the back. And um, donation five is a mummification experiment who was later buried, flexed on her back, and she's still currently buried. Uh, I will be uh, excavating her in um, the spring of next year. Um, so with regards to the findings, and I'm really going to rush through this, I'm very sorry, but with regards to the findings on the disarticulation sequence, one of the main outcomes of this study is essentially we're uh, confirming what we already knew in archaeotanatology, that um, the body position affects the order of uh, disarticulation and the process of disarticulation of the joints. Um, so I noticed that very subtle sort of asymmetrical positioning of the body can lead to huge differences in disarticulation of the joints on either side. So as an example, you'll see here the right shoulder and the left shoulder, and there's over a month in between. Now for an experiment that lasted just seven months, that's a, a huge time difference between the, the both sides of the body. Um, but I also, like Clara, saw um, a lot of reversals in this um, label persistent uh, joint connection. So the, the so-called early disconnectors and the late disconnectors, um, we see, depending on the body, different, uh, body position, we see a huge uh, difference in, um, yeah, in results. Um, another main thing that came out of this investigation is there are so many variables that affect the process of disarticulation. Um, just moisture, body position, obviously, as we're speaking about this a lot, uh, but body mass index, or how large is an individual, uh, the age and the health of the donor, but hugely importantly, insect activity. So uh, fly larvae uh, hatch into maggots, and maggots can have a huge effect on the disconnection of the bone. They can get into the joints and move apart the bones and eat away the connective tissues, they will move around entire bones within an open space, especially the smaller bones of the hands and feet. So if you find a burial where the hands and feet are on the floor, but they're completely distributed, it's very likely that that is caused by uh, insect activity. And um, the problem with all of these variables is that they're acting on the body at the same time. It's very hard to distinguish what is the result of one variable versus another. And that leads to a problem with the models that we currently have, because these are mostly based on archaeological burials. And in these archaeological burials, we have the end result of all of these variables acting on the body. So it's very hard for us to then distinguish what is the result of what. And that brings me to uh, the accuracy of some of our current models. Um, as I said, the insects are a huge factor that are currently not factored in. So insect activity is hugely dependent on environment, temperature, access to the body, wrapping of the body, that kind of thing. Um, but I also noticed cases of re-articulation of the joints. It doesn't happen frequently, but depending on the position of the body, bones can disconnect and later reassume their approximate anatomical position, which means if we were to come along a thousand years later and excavate that burial, we would never know that that disconnection took place. 
meaning any models that we base on older burials by uh, de facto don't include that part of the process. So we're not including everything. Um, then with regards to our findings, uh, my findings on bone displacement. So the aims of this part of the project was to both visualize the movement of bones over time as well as to quantify their movements. Um, and my intention was to use the 3D models that I created every week and overlay these sequential models, which allow you to then create heat maps and you know quantify the displacement over time. Uh, that ran into a lot of problems. I mean, it gives good results, but if you look at this model on day 11 for donation one, you see there's a lot of missing data, and that's because of the maggot mass moving around, and things that move don't capture very well with the photogrammetry. But if we then compare that day 11 to day 16 and then create a heat map, you can see the green and yellow areas are the areas where there's the most difference between the two models. But we're seeing the most difference where the soft tissue is reducing. So that's just a natural part of decomposition. And what we're actually interested in is what's happening to the skeleton underneath, what's happening with these disconnections. Um, so we started looking for ways to visualize and uh, quantify that. So what we did uh, is we visualized in 3D animation and we quantified with 3D GIS, thank you. And um, we took the weekly models that are created in the field and the models of each individual bone that are created afterwards and we basically refitted the skeleton into the human body, which obviously uh, requires a lot of uh, good anatomical knowledge. And then we were to able, able to remove the uh, field models, leaving us with the position of the bones of the individual, and then animate the steps in between. So you see here the result of a work with uh, Sada Glushitz, my co-author. She did this as her um, master thesis, and we used the photogrammetrical models to animate, in this case, just the first two weeks of the experiment. It's an ongoing project. This lasted seven and a half months, and we aim to um, uh, animate the rest and uh, give her her hands and feet, because we don't have them in this uh, model yet. But um, it's really interesting to see this kind of movement of the body happening in the sort of sped up <coughs> time frame. You can also see, and we'll go into a, a zoomed in shot in a minute, the different disconnections that are happening very early on and at the same time. So here we'll see the neck area. Uh, bear in mind this is someone who's seated upright and she's slumping forward. And you'll start to see a disconnection occurring here between C4 and C5. And later we'll see, because of this position, um, cervical vertebrae reassuming their uh, initial position. And at the same time, on day 9 and 10, we see the, uh, the right hip is disconnecting. I'm very sorry, but I have to skip through this if you want to see the rest. Um, so uh, for um, the quantification of the movement, we took this same model that we used for animation and uh, brought it into a 3D GIS uh, environment where we could then um, measure the distance between articulation points of the bones. The hypothesis of this part of the project is that if we do this consistently in a large enough sample, um, we might be able to identify signature disarticulation patterns if they do indeed exist. This would require a very large sample, uh, which is something that we hope to be able to do in, uh, in future. So just to illustrate what I mean, here is the same donation in the 3D GIS environment on day one of the experiment and day 216, uh, which was the final day of the experiment in her case. And if we just focus on her lower limbs, we can see this is just an illustration, these weren't the actual measurements, but we can track, you know, connected uh, joints this way. And there again on the last day, and that would provide us for each joint of the body, the distance in change between the start and the end of the experiment. And if we have this for a large enough uh, sample of individuals in the same position, we might be able to identify particular patterns. Um, for this slide, all I want to say is, again, we need to replicate this. This is hugely valuable information for uh, how we interpret burials currently. But in order to perhaps develop strong models from this, we need to replicate it in other environments in a very large um, sample size as well. And finally, I just wanted to, um, to note really the importance of this kind of actualistic experimental work in the field. 
Um, we need more people becoming involved in this and more people doing this in different environmental conditions so we have a comparative data set because if we do have that we can improve existing taphonomic models that we have. We have the opportunity to develop potentially new taphonomic models, for example using the 3D GIS method um, and all of that taken together is hugely beneficial to archaeology, mortuary archaeology but archaeology in general, particularly when we're dealing with complex contexts such as mass graves, but basically any situation where we want to extract as much information as possible in the shortest time possible. Thank you very much.